Good evening, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here this evening for a really exciting artists panel. My name is Director, <laughs> Hair Director Chief. No, my name is Eric Siegel, Director of Education here at the Harm Museum of Art. Um, I've been looking forward to this program for a long time since Plural Domains opened. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful exhibition. I'm sure you've had a chance to see it. I invite you to come visit before it closes in April. Um, tonight, there's quite a few introductions, so I'll be very brief, but I just wanted to let you know that this is, um, the evening's program is made possible by the Harn Eminent Scholar Chair in Art History Program. That's HESCA. HESCA is organized out of the School of um, Art and Art History with the participation of the museum and is a really wonderful program that was founded um, by David A. and Marianne Coffrin uh, to bring together the museum and the school. And it really works that way. And that's why we're here tonight. Uh, I'm just going to introduce briefly Jesus Fuenmayor, uh, director and curator of the University Gallery at the School of Art and Art History. It's been such a pleasure to work with Jesus throughout this project, presenting plural domains here at the, the Harn. Um, Jesus is a visionary curator, a, uh, an advocate of contemporary artists, and uh, he will be introducing the program proper this evening. So please join me in welcoming Jesus. Hello, uh, good night, how are you? Thank you, Eric, for your introduction. Um, I want to thank very briefly, I don't want to make it too long, uh, all the people that has uh, helped us uh, um, in the organization of, uh, of this event and the, and the exhibition, the uh, Plural Domains uh, collection from the Cisneros, uh, Cisneros Fontanas Foundation collection. Um, and uh, I want to thank especially the, all, the, all the people, all the staff here at the museum, uh, Leanne uh, Chesterfield and uh, Dulce Roman and all the people in the staff that uh, were so Eric Eric Siegel and everybody was so helpful with uh, uh, all the uh, organizational details of uh, putting this uh, ambitious project together. So what I'm going to do, very uh, I'm going to be very as short as possible. Um, is uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Jose Falconi, who is the moderator of our event today. The, the idea of this event since, uh, since the beginning was uh, to, to bring the artists of the uh, exhibition into conversation with the audience here in, uh, in our university, in our town. So uh, I think it's very important uh, at the end of, uh, of the presentations that uh, you feel motivated, I hope so, that you feel motivated to, to uh, create a dialogue with them, to ask questions and, and to, um, yeah, to see, uh, to create this, uh, this, uh, th this is the, the motivation of this event, to create this uh, dialogue, right? So Dr. Jose Falconi, Jose Luis Falconi, was born in uh, Lima. He's a professor of uh, art and human rights at the University of Connecticut, as well as the president of uh, Cultural Agents, is uh, an NGO which promotes uh, civic engagement and creativity through artistic education. From 2001 to 2011, Falconi was the art forum curator of, um, at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University, curating more than uh, 30 shows of cutting edge Latino and Latin American artists in an academic setting. Uh, this uh, uh, is uh, referring to a space that is best known as the Carpenter Center in, uh, in Harvard University. From 2011 to 2017, he was associate of the Department of Art History and Architecture at the Harvard University also, where he received his doctorate in Romance Languages and Literatures in 2010 and his postdoctorate the following year in the history of art and architecture under the supervision of Professor Thomas Cummins. 
His uh, latest academic uh, publication uh, include Portraits of an Invisible Country, the photograph of uh, Jorge Mario Munera, that was in 2010, The Singular Plurality, the works of Dario Escobar, that was in 2013, The Great uh, Swindle, a project by Santiago Montoya in 2014, and Ad Usum, to be used, the works of Pedro Reyes, it was a publication uh, that was done in 2017. His monograph on Mexican artist uh, Pia Camille, There Are no, no Friendly Fires, will be published in 2022. In the, in the United States, Falcone has been appointed lecturer at the Department of Art History and Architecture at Brandeis uh, University from 2014 to 2020, at Boston University in the spring of 2016, and in the School of Fine Arts at the University of Connecticut in the spring of 2021. In Latin America, he was a bicentennial visiting professor of aesthetics at the University of, San of Chile in Santiago in 20, from 2012 to 2019, international professor at the National University of Colombia, Bogota, visiting professor at the Center for Latin American Studies, um, Manuel College at the University San Carlos de Guatemala, of Guatemala, and, and in 2016, and distinguished visiting professor at the University of Costa Rica in 2017. Please join me uh, welcoming our uh, moderator for the today panel discussion, Dr. Jose Falconi. Thank you very much, Jesus. You hear me well? Excellent. Um, for me, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, seeing real people, you know, um, um, it is always uh, gratifying um, to get together. And uh, I really thank Jesus for this opportunity, for um, uh, the museum, for uh, bringing us all together, you know, as if, you know, as it was used to do like a few years ago. Um, Second of all, I, I really also want to want to um, thank for the incredible hospitality of the university. And um, for me, it's, it's an immense, immense privilege to be here. You know, I know a lot of friends by um, Sergio is here, you know, uh, Kaira Cabañas, uh, a dear colleague of mine, um, as well as Jesus. So really, and also, Quite, it's quite nice to be outside of Boston, you know, I mean, in, in days like this, tomorrow there is a storm. So um, what we are going to try to do is going to, I'm going to introduce the, pan, the, the artist and um, then each of them are going to um, come up here and give the presentation. After that, we'll all get together in a dialogue with hopefully with all of you, okay? So let me um, introduce first Amalia Pica who is going to be joining us um, over the internet, um, over Zoom. Um, Amalia Pica received her BA from the Escuela Nacional de Bellas Artes in Buenos Aires in 2003 and attended graduate school at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. Pica has had solo exhibits at the Malmo Constal in Sweden in 2010, the University of Michigan Museum of Art in Ann Arbor in 2011, modern, uh, the Modern Art Oxford at the uh, she's in Hill Gallery in London, and at the Kunsthalle St. Gallen in Switzerland, all in 2012. Also at the MIT, uh, Liz Visual Arts Center in Cambridge, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, El Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, El Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes in Neuquén, Argentina in 2014, uh, the Van Aven Museum in the Netherlands in 2014, and the Kunstverein uh, Freiburg in Germany in 2016, her work has been also included in numerous group shows, uh, group exhibitions such as Adventures of Black Square at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, Under the Same Sun, Art from Latin America and Today at the Guggenheim Museum in 2015, and the Ungovernables, the New Museum Triennial at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in 2012, Silence at the Menil Collection in 2012, Map Marathon at the Serpentine Gallery in 2010, World Event at the Kunsthalle Basel in 2008 drawing typologies at the Sterling Museum 20, in 2007, the Wanju Biennial of Korea in 2016, and the Venice Biennial in 2011 and 2015. 
She's a recipient of the CIFRO grant from the Cisneros and Danalsar Foundation, a finalist for the Future Generation Art Prize from the Pinchuk Foundation, and received com and recently completed our art residency in the prestigious Headland Center for the Arts outside of San Francisco. Pika received the Paul Hamlin for a Foundation Award. She lives and works in London. Then Alice Milcelli will follow. She was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1980, where she still lives and works. Her recent show, solo shows include Proyecto Chernobyl at the American Society in 2019 in New York, and Profunditaje Campos Minados at the Instituto Pipa, Villa More in 2019 in Rio de Janeiro, 88 from uh, 14,000 14, at Max Protect Gallery in 2011 in New York. She uh, was featured in the fifth Moscow International Biennial for Young Art, Deep Inside, in 2016 in Russia. And her recent group shows include Einten Sao at the sixth Seni Sesi Senai Marcantuno Villasa Prize at the Museo Arte Contemporáneo de Goiás in Guyana, at the Museo de Industria in Fortaleza, the Museo Historico Nacional in Rio de Janeiro, the Santander Cultural in Porto Alegre, Brazil. Um, the show also, um, she's also um, part of the show, The Material is Invisible at the Jan van Eyck Academic Plain in Maastricht in the Netherlands, Gianti dos Conocimientos u Otro de Galería de Arte Solar in 2017 in Rio de Janeiro, and Memory League, be used from between archiving a memory at La Capella in Barcelona, Spain. Her works are included in important institutional collections such as the Sao Cultural Video Brazil in Sao Paulo, Brazil, the Cisneros Fontanal Art Foundation, Miami, the Moscow Biennial Art Foundation, the Museo de Arte Moderna Rio de Janeiro, Mami Rio, and in Rio de Janeiro. And finally, uh, Jose Gabriel Hernandez will speak who is an artist based in New York. He studied fine arts at the Middlesex Polytechnic in London between 1979 and 1982, at the Slade School of Fine Arts, University of London between 86 and 88, and the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York between 88 and 89. Fernandez had exhibited internationally, both in North and South America, as well as Europe, including the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in Texas, the PS1 Contemporary Art Center in New York, the Museo de Arte Moderno of Rio de Janeiro, um, and the Centro Reina Sofia in Madrid, Spain. He has solo exhibitions at the Hoosley Parlor in London in 2019, at Enrique Farias um, Fine Arts in New York in 2011, at the Sala Mendoza in Caracas in 2010, at the Galleria Emma Molina in Monterrey, Mexico, and Sicardi Gallery in Houston in 20, 2003. His work has been featured in major service of Latin American contemporary art, and is represented in major private and public collections. Among the group of exhibitions, he has participated in the 14th Biennial of Cuenca in Cuenca, Ecuador in 2018, Contingent Beauty in the Contemporary Art from Latin America in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston in 2016, Postkinetic Conceptualism and Geometry in Venezuela at Cabe Gallery in Miami in 2011, Correspondence and Contemporary Art from the Pat Colección Patricia Feld de Cisneros, uh, at the Bear and Wild Galleries in Wheaton College in 2010, at the sixth biennial of uh, Mercosur Biennial in Porto Alegre in 2007, and in 2006, Jump Cuts, Venezuelan Contemporary Art from the collection, from the collection Mercantil at the American Society in New York, where, where I had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time, you know, and as well, I met for the first time Jesus. Um, and also at the Archivo Pons, Coldo, Michelena Cultura Sebastian in Spain, and Paralelos, the Museo de Arte Moderna in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So our, I mean, I will leave it now with, with Amalia, who she will start giving her presentation, but as you can see, these are three great artists. So, and we have the privilege of having them here. So um, please help and join me in welcoming Amalia Pica. Hi everyone, um, can you hear me well? Can you see me? Okay, good. Um, so um, thank you for having me in this way. It's uh, sad for me not to be there, but it's also wonderful that um, we've learned a few things in the last couple of years that have been very tough in many other respects. Um, I, um, and thank you Jesus 
for inviting me and thank you to the university. Um, I sort of uh, have been very lucky and I have been making work for a long time. Um, and so it's always kind of um, funny to have to give a presentation that is 15 minutes um, because you have to kind of um, decide which works you're gonna show and also the ones that you're not going to show. Um, so I just uh, made a little uh, presentation that sort of contextualizes the work that uh, is in the exhibition. And so I've gone a little bit backwards and then a little bit forwards from there. Um, let me just um, share my screen so I can show you this presentation. Yeah, that's just my name. Um, I guess I decided to start here. This work is called uh, Sorry for the Metaphor. Um, the title comes from a book of, uh, not from a book, but from just a, a phrase in a book by uh, Roberto Olaño who was an amazing Chilean writer. Um, I don't know how relevant that's, that is, but it's always sort of funny to, to pinpoint when one feels like a Latin American artist. Um, Sorry for the Metaphor was a work that I did, uh, or a series that I started in 2005 when I had moved from Buenos Aires. I'm originally from Patagonia. Uh, so I was born in Neuquén, in the north of Patagonia, in Argentina. Um, and I moved to Buenos Aires to do art school there. And then um, I got a scholarship to go to the Rijks Academy in Holland, in Amsterdam. Uh, I was quite young. And when I got there for the first time, I realized that I was an Argentinian artist somehow before I just thought I was an artist. Um, and one of the things that I realized was that I had this huge um, desire to, for my work, or maybe, more than a desire, also like um, a sense of responsibility. I thought that as an artist, I needed to speak um, of my time uh, or to my time, um, that the sort of we had as artists a sort of a political role to play, if you want. And I quickly realized that Europeans viewed this as, um, as a very romantic idea and as a very specific idea. Obviously, um, uh, you know, um, Latin America didn't uh, sort of uh, create contemporary art uh, and in Europe art the way that we know it now is kind of folklore so that those are two very different ideas um, and so I basically had this desire to say things to be understood um, but uh, had a realization that that was a sort of a, a romantic um, idea of what being an artist was. So this is a picture of me in the Black Forest in Germany, where I went uh, to take this picture uh, with a megaphone in my hand. I was sort of trying to uh, talk to trees. So it was the overlapping of art, art historical romanticism and this idea of finding a voice as an artist. Um, this is a work that I put here because um, because of this idea of finding a voice as an artist. So uh, it was a sort of a, a, a big uh, print of uh, the desert with a book. And every now and then um, I would just come and bang the book against um, the print or the, the mural. Um, there was a caption that accompanied this work and then that it said the following. Then there was the explorer Joseph Ritchie whom Keats, to whom Keats gave a copy of his newly published poem, Endymion, with instructions to place it in his, his travel pack, read it on his journey, and then throw it into the heart of the Sahara Desert. Keats received a letter from Ritchie, date from near Cairo in December 1818. Endymion has arrived thus far on his way to the desert. And when you're sitting over your Christmas fire, will be jogging in all probability on a camel's back over those African sands immeasurable. After this, there was silence. Joseph Richard never returned. Richard Holmes, the age of wonder, hyperpress. So this is uh, just a quote that I included. And the reason why I sort of loved uh, encountering this passage was um, because of this idea that as an artist, um, you might 
have something to say but but you sort of throw it out there and you never know how it's going to be received and in this case you don't even know whether it sort of reached this desti destination um i've sort of um included this uh work called islands it's also very very old we're looking at very old work by the way um, it's a work that I did while I was in Holland and it's a slide projection and it's a sequence of um, this uh, character sort of stepping in the snow and drawing the picture of a palm tree and I guess it had sort of I decided to put it after Endymion's journey because it sort of plays to that sort of idea of an exotic landscape and the nostalgia that comes with um, displacement um, but also with sort of having a um, a preconceived idea of what far away places look like. Obviously, um, a lot of people thought, oh, she's Latin American. She's very, she must be suffering here in Holland with all this cold and she's very used to, you know, warm weather. And I'm from Patagonia where it's very cold. Um, so I just, um, I like thinking about cliches, but also um, I've always been interested in, in images that act as work words a little bit so like the, the image of a desert island and what is it like to look at it and what do people get from it and this anxiety that people seem to have around contemporary art and the idea um, that art should be understood somehow um, so questions of whether we have things to say as artists and whether art is a communi communicative act have been at sort of the core of my practice for a long time um, uh, so for a while I was very focused on sort of what it's like to sort of send a message and then I became interested in the idea of reception. Um, I realized that, um, you know, you, we don't just have everything pre-thought and then just speak it, but that it is in the process of speaking that one is sort of, as it were, making thinking or making thought. Um, and so that there's sort of in that traditional um idea of the communication of communication where there's a, a sender a medium and a receiver the the receiver seems to be quite passive but actually none of the message or the medium would exist without a receiver um, so I started thinking about that and this is a work that I did um, and that also sort of has a caption and so it's a it's sort of a homemade television an antenna and uh, oops, sorry I'll just go back uh, and it has this text that goes with it. It says, um, shows in which wannabe pop stars compete to win the backing of the viewing public are a staple of TV channels around the world. Afghanistan is no different. Afghan Star was first aired in 2005 and it soon became a national phenomenon. By the time the finale of the third season was broadcast, 11 million people tuned in. Each finalist had their ardent fans. One man drove for 14 hours to collect posters promoting his favorite singer, while others sold, another sold his car to raise funds to campaign for one of the contestants. But watching television is not always easy in Afghanistan. With scarce electricity subject to regular power cuts, Afghan Star, The Power of Pop, a documentary by the British filmmaker Havana Markin, shows one young fan, fan constructing and right, um, wiring a homemade television antenna in order to get a signal. The program's success highlights the return of Western pop culture to the mainstream in Afghanistan, where music was banned by the Taliban in the 1990s. Viewers voted for their favorite singer by mobile phone. For many, this was the first time they were asked to express a preference in a public forum. Um, so yeah, the sculpture itself was just a homemade television antenna. Um, and this uh, sort of takes me to a work that is very much part of the series um, of the work that is in the exhibition. The, the work in the exhibition has the added um, feature of having a doorway, but it's basically this, um, a giant wall that you see here and that has like little holes and once you get closer you realize there's some um, cans um, that are sort of covering the holes from the inside of the structure and then um, those cans are connected to um, other cans on the other side uh, very much in the way that we or some of us used to play as kids using these tin can telephones um, so this is a work that I like to think of as a sort of a, a work about how complicated it is to talk to one another or a machine of lost, uh, lost stories. Um, it's called Switchboard. And it's sort of, it's a work that 
feels like maybe it's inviting participation and it feels very simple, but actually as soon as you try to use it, you realize that that sort of the, the act of communicating with one another is made very, very complicated by not knowing which can you might be talking or listening into because the immensity of the world doesn't allow you uh, to know that. And so you have to negotiate and there's the, all this negotiation of trying to find the can that is connected to then just say something very simple like hello. Um, so it's just sort of um, an invitation to um, to feel in your own body how complicated it is to talk to one another um, and how much we are willing to try. Uh, so a similar work to that is what you'll see in the exhibition. I then decided to, to bring you to eavesdropping, which is a work that uses like a similar idea of, um, of uh, something stuck to the wall to represent listening. So I became, as I said before, interested in the figure of the listener. Um, but I wanted to create works that weren't necessarily an auditory experience, but a visual experience. And so I became interested in that little sort of um, gesture of someone holding their, uh, a glass against the wall to eavesdrop on their neighbor and um, yeah, made this uh, work, which are all these um, glasses that are um, stuck to a wall um, in that sort of, um, yeah, uh, picking up on that gesture. This is a work called In Praise of Listening. Again, it has to do with listening and uh, they're um, replicas of uh, hearing aids. And I think of them as, uh, as sort of, um, yeah, tributes to listening. This is the cast of someone's inner ear. Uh, then sort of uh, carved in stone. And in this exhibition at the power plant in Toronto, it was paired up with these um, sort of big um, cardboard structures that you see here. Um, uh, the, the, the play on scale is that the hearing aids obviously are uh, smaller than these big giant uh, structures, but they are um, uh, a lot bigger than the real size um, hearing aids. Whereas these acoustic radars, as they're called, um, the the work itself it, it's called ears to speak of, of but they are replicas of acoustic radars which are um i'll show you some images now but i am um, experimental listening devices that were developed um in between wars um uh but mostly uh in world war one by the british uh other countries did try to do this too and um there was sort of uh, machines that were made for um let me just see if i there there are some examples these are portable ones that they basically they sort of they were um thought of to be able they were invented to be able to predict airplane bombing um and obviously they seem very whimsical to us now they didn't really work um they didn't help us um help them predict bombing but they did um contribute a lot to the development of radar technology. So I don't have an image of that here for some reason, but um, they were also stationary. So the ones that you saw are portable, they were also stationary ones. And these are three giant listening ears that are in the in the English coast um, near Dungeness. Um, and so I sort of made these replicas of them almost like props made out of cardboard, which obviously it's a material that absorbs sound. So it's sort of, speaks of for the failure of this experiment uh, even before it took off. Um, and just so not to bore you um, with only um, with sort of these concerns about what it's like to be an artist and what it's like to try to communicate as an artist and what it's like to talk to each other, I thought I'll, I'll just show you a very sort of niche and small and limited uh, uh, body of work that I did uh, a couple of years ago. Um, to end this presentation, uh, that it was in relationship to, to the dream or uh, the utopia of uh, interspecies communication. So this work that you see here, it's called Please Open uh, Harry, which is, um, and it's sort of in American Sign Language, so it's Harry. Um, and it, uh, it's a work that I did as a tribute to a signing uh, ape. Um, her name was um, Washu and she was a chimpanzee and she had been uh, 
reared uh, in an American uh, family as a child, so she had been taken away from her mother uh, in in the jungle in Africa and taken to America and um, she was being raised by a family who was talking to her in sign language. Uh, the experiment here was to see if whether you could um, teach sign language to a, an ape, to a chimpanzee. Um, and this is what she used to sign every morning to her carers when they um, came to open the cage. So she would say, please open Harry. Um, the, the language experiments um, were then sort of um, considered a failure. And every time, even though like there are um, a lot of uh, documentation of apes uh, signing up to 200 words, whenever animals sort of came close to to acquiring language, the, la the frontier of what it meant to speak or um, was moved so that we could make sure that we remain the only um, animals that can um, access and use language. Um, I also became very interested in the efforts that uh, the scientists uh, make to try to communicate with these great apes during the course of those experiments. And this is a language that, uh, this is a replica of a board, which is often given to great apes in these uh, laborator laboratories. Um, which is called uh, with a language that is called Yerkish. So Yerkish, um, uh, it's named after a um, Robert Yerkes, who had one of the biggest uh, uh, primate labs in the U.S. Um, but basically, it's it's a, it's sort of um, a language that is based on exactly the opposite of a pictogram. Let's say so they are uh, symbols that should have no representational relationship. To the, um, to the word that they represent so that apes could sequence them in on a keyboard. And the fact that they didn't look like the sign for an apple didn't look like an apple um, was something that uh, could show that apes were capable of, um, of um, abstract thought, basically. Um, here in, in this particular sort of sculpture, there's these pictorial panels that are um, uh, collages. And here at the top row, uh, it says, um, hello, uh, visitors, look, uh, picture, thank you. And so uh, basically I sort of became interested in how um, we've sort of become so proud of this idea that we communicate, but that basically we've sort of whenever we approached other species um, in thinking how um, they are capable of communicating we're constantly um, sort of having the communicational act be in our terms. So these apes are in captivity. They have to like, there's obviously ways in which uh, great apes were incredibly uh, intelligent beings. Um, um, communicate with one another, yet um, most of the effort has gone into us teaching them a form of language that we can understand and we impose on them. Um, so it was just that this is a body of work that I did uh, thanks to an invitation by a primatologist called Volker Sommer to go to Nigeria and um, observe these chimpanzees remotely, but very soon it became apparent to me that it was sort of, that I wouldn't feel comfortable using the image of an ape um, that it sort of there was a certain violence um, around the way that we observe and view animals uh, and study them even and so I just sort of became interested in how the scientists um, created all these artifacts and the material culture around it if you want um, so and the violence of that communicative act anyways I'm, I'm going to end there um, uh, because I'm conscious of time uh, and I'm sure there'll be an opportunity for questions. Thank you. And I'm going to bring up the more the light in a moment. Yeah, yes. a little bit more light. I'll do that when I am. Um, 
that's not correct. <laughs> Let me go up in the there. I'll get the lights and the uh... Just need to make like my presentation. Yes. yes. Okay, that looks beautiful. Okay, perfect. I'll fix that in a moment. Let me know. No, let me know when we get to go. Let's see. You see? Yes, that's good. Turns it on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So hello everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you Jesus for putting this together and then inviting us. It's really delightful to be able to travel and see colleagues and have conversations in person again. I mean, I, I've been really looking forward to do this. Um, I will mainly focus uh, tonight at the, the larger project which originated the series that we have in the exhibition. But before we go into that, I'll just, um, I think it'll be interesting to look a little bit at, at my history in terms of, of um, education uh, to understand how is it that I arrived at, at such questions. So briefly, I went to film school and then I worked in the film industry for a little while. I was an assistant, assistant director in films and documentaries. And after a while doing that, I realized that my main interest, much more than considering only questions of feature films and the way meaning is ascribed to image in film, was to um, inquire, how is it that images themselves are constructed? What goes behind them? I mean, what is this many different varied uh, possible um, groups or conventions that animate images that sometimes we don't even realize um, what is that structure behind them. So at that point, I decided to then uh, not, not traditionally work in the movies anymore and then start uh, researching to creating my own images. I'm not sure this is, I'm not sure this is going. Just to, to change the... To go to the next slide? To, yes. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. Can we use the keyboard to pass the it's slide? Not, it's not really. Can I do this from here? Yes. Good. Okay, good. So this is the name of the project. It's called in Portuguese, in, in Profundidade Campos Minados, which uh, translates to in-depth landmines or in-depth minefields. It has been translated in both ways. Um, it is a, a project that looks at the space of minefields as they remain today, even 
years or you know decades after uh, the originating war or conflict that put those explosives, those unexploded ordnance in the ground um, ended and that this sort of silent occupation is still in, in these landscapes. And so it stays. So it's something that begin, I mean, that has a date in the past, but that remains in the present tense in the sense that it's, it's still here with us occupying space uh, on, on earth. So my, uh, one of the first references that I decided to, that drew my attention to the space of minefields was looking at this image shot by the photographer Robert Kappa, um, who was I mean, one, of, one of the very mythical, most well-known photojournalists of all time, the founder of the Magnum Agency, Agency in New York. And um, the last image that he ever took was in the minefield. And following that, he stepped in the landmine and died. That's the image. And what struck me is that this image uh, captures a horizon, which is here represented, that Kappa himself never reached, right? So in between where he stands and then seconds later after this click and that horizon, um, it, it was the last instant of his life. Another, uh, following this, another interesting uh, account of people uh, attempting to go across minefields came from this book called Baia dos Tigres, Bay of Tigers in English, which is written by a Portuguese journalist um, who was sent as a journalist to cover uh, the civil war in Angola. And as he found himself, the, his name is Pedro Rosa Mendes, as he found himself in Angola in this sort of um, situation of being a foreign journalist, especially a Portuguese uh, person in Angola, which used to be, it is a former Portuguese colony as Brazil, um, that uh, he realized there were a lot of limitations to this kind, to his positioning in that in that land in this situation. So he decided not to do the the the, the newspaper piece and just um, go into the minefield across it and then write an account of it. And these are um, on the these are two quotations from the from the book. Just one minute. So the first one reads, um, on, every, on every inch of this ground is the last instant of my life. I can contemplate it as far as the eye can see. It's a loose translation, okay? I'm. Um, I translated it from Portuguese. And then the second one was this other one that said, who died, stayed, or who died, remained. And for me, what was really interesting here was this sort of um, inversions uh, between looking at a spatial perception of time, and then on the other hand, this temporal perception of space, right? Because if you are living, if you step in a mine and you die, uh, it means that your time is over, your life has ended. It's a, it's a question of duration. But in terms of a minefield, if that happens to you in that, in that spatial setting, what it really means, and that's what it meant for Kappa, for instance, is that, is that he stayed. He never went on, on, on to the depth of, of that field uh, himself. And then, um, so for me as a photographer and then looking at, at these references, especially the Kappa image, what I was wondering is what if I were to try to 
continue this exploration um, from where Kappa himself, I mean, I mean symbolically, uh, could not go further. And what it means to walk across uh, such a landscape which is uh, not only inaccessible, but kind of really spatially impenetrable. Um, how is it that we, how is it that you can step into it? And why is it that you see? So in, the, in this work, um, the way this is articulated um, relates to the intrinsical uh, principles behind photography, which is where is, it, where is it that you step in the outer frame on the ground, meaning your point of view, the focal length of the two of the elected two that you have in hand, in my case, I mean, being a photographer, then the lens, how far or how distant or how close you are to a given subject matter. And then what is, uh, what, what, what the magnification size of your chosen object will be in the image that you're able to capture from the vantage point from where you stand. These elements, where you step, what you see, and then the resulting image, they are behind each and every photograph, right? It doesn't matter if it is a very sophisticated, sort of constructed professional image or an iPhone image, it's always there. It's not always necessarily uh, elements which um, have to be activated, but they can be. And so the work uh, is really developed in, this inter in the intertwining of all of these principles in relationship to this space where positioning, meaning where one steps on the ground is the most critical element. Meaning that if, I mean, if you step from here to there, it could be the difference between life and death, right? So the work was developed across different uh, mind uh, areas in different continents. That's, that's all of the places that I had to visit to do the work. So the first one was Cambodia, and which has a lot of minefields in, in, as, a, as remains of the Khmer Rouge uh, dictatorship. The second one was Colombia, which is the work that we have here at the show, where uh, the mine areas are very particular uh, and very different from all of the others that I encountered in, in other places in the, in the sense that they are in the jungle. So that that's remains from, uh, from the FARC, right? And then the FARC, the, um, the whole drug traffic, they're really masters of the jungle. Um, this very rugged, sort of closed off terrain in a very different logic than the logic of war, for instance, which is what, what basic logic, the logic of war and conquering terrain as we see in Cambodia, for instance, this, this was very different Colombia and, my, and the most difficult access. So the other one was Bosnia, which remains of the, the war in Yugoslavia. And then the last one was Angola, which is the most uh, mined place on earth. And then that's a result of 40 years of you know, in the independence wars and then civil war. So what, what I'd like to do is to show you all of the series. Um, we will see each image in each of the series one by one. Uh, there will be a black slide in between them, right? So uh, we, in this setting, I can still preserve the interval between, between each one of the images.
something that uh, you will notice, um, the amount of images that belong to each series, it's not always the same. And, and that's really um, intrinsical to, to the kind of access that was possible in, in each one of the terrains. So in Angola, for instance, we just seen 15 images because it's where from, from all of the minefields, it's the one that I was able to walk further and produce the most uh, number of point of views. And in Colombia, which, which is our work here, uh, because of such difficult conditions and, and the problems of, of uh, explosives in the jungle, it was um, where um, it was the least possible to really uh, advance through. So for instance, in Colombo, there were only seven points of views, only seven images. In Bosnia, we are going to see nine images. That's to give an example of, of how the work is supposed to be displayed. There you go. So um, all the, the enlargements and then the images are, are hung side by side and with a little spatial interval in between them. So that's why when we look at them here, we have the black slide in between so we can preserve that sort of uh, space in between them. So in closing, and then I guess we can um, leave questions open for, for conversation. Um, an aspect of this work, which is new to me, 
is that um, it's both the visual result that we see here, but it also has this uh, performance aspect to it because it's a, it's an action that is twofold. It's that of my own body or the, the body of the photographer in the outer frame going across, growing within this, this inaccessible, impenetrable spaces and trying, I mean, striving to be able to offer point of views, not, not of it, above it, but from within, and as well as the visual result of it, which is what we get to see in the exhibition. So it's, it's these both things together. That's it. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here sharing a little bit of normalcy in these most troubling hours. And um, I want to thank Jesus Fuenmayor and the great team here at the University of Florida Galleries for putting up oh, the Horn Museum for putting this great exhibition together. So um, I'm going to start by having on this image, the work that is in the exhibition, just to show you, because my intention in this presentation is to show the process by which I arrived at such seemingly abstract, minimalist and achromatic language in my uh, recent work. And I came to it uh, through one of the least abstract cultural traditions and I became a bullfighting aficionado in the 90s. I traveled extensively through Mexico, um, Spain and Venezuela, doing research and doing courses in bullfighting. I was really um, into it. And one of the great things, I mean, I, I loved and I was immersed in all of the um, aspects of the, of the tradition. But the thing that uh, really interested me was the body of the matador. Um, because of its um, series of layers between issues of masculinity, um, sexuality, homosexuality, eroticism, uh, and androgyny. So one of the things that I did at that time was to purchase some secondhand um, trajes de luces, which means suits of lights. Um, this is one of the examples that I did and I worked with a seamstress and we took down a lot of the uh, sequins and decorations and silver threads and inserted these um, red eyelets that were embroidered. Um, so to create an, an image of desire, and the title of the piece is called Anatomy of Desire. And also shares, it references a lot of the um, Catholic um, iconography the, the, that accompanies the tradition. Um, so me and the seamstress took another dress and we took it all apart and produced all the stencils, the patterns of the dress and I proceeded in 1998 to make this piece here. It's called Armario de Luces, Armoire of Lights. And the idea of this work was to include all of the elements that the matador takes with him in his um, journeys. And basically the matador is a traveling artist. And the idea of the armoire was that it included all of the elements, the, the muleta, the muleta de trajes de luces, la garrocha, la puntilla, and so on. 
So the next step was to what to do with these flat surfaces. And I started to um, figure out ways of bending them to um, animate them in some kind of way. And I produced a series of works on thin plywood um, that hung from a nail. And you can already see on this piece here, there's already a kind of um, constructivist tendency uh, in the development of this body of work. Another traje de luces that uh, was this one here is called Anatomy of Fate. As you can see, it's a totally different material. It's constructed in stainless steel mesh, which I used as an idea to represent the, 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 the way that the matador's dress is like um, an armor. And on the surface of this mesh, uh, we um, silk screened some motif that I took from the previous dress um, to create the idea of blood as is, you know, in the process of tattooing, you get these little droplets of blood um, on this dress. So there's a, basically the, the, the actual suit of lights uh, is like actually as a dress is some kind of tattoo that you, the matador wears. Then um, around the same eight, uh, time at the end of the decade, uh, produced this work um, called Still Life. And here you can see the, um, the, the table, um, I, I made this table that I, in wood and I covered it in gesso. And um, the, the table becomes like the body of the matador. Um, you know, it's a, there's a very high, highly charged um, homoerotic um, component to this work. And I originally wanted to use some uh, lines or a line from a poem by Garcia Lorca, um, the lament on the death of Ignacio Sanchez Mejias, who was a, a very, very famous um, Spanish bullfighter, where one of the lines he talks about the drops of blood that were left on, on the ruedo when he was killed by a bull. So the, the, I left some of the wood to be seen on the surface of the table that, that somehow works both ways as, as the flesh that is being penetrated by the horns and at the same time represents the blood, the blood stains on the, on the, on the ruedo. And then I continued uh, this idea of permutating the, the suit of lights and gradually it became uh, disembodied. Um, this is made with um, just a muslin and covered in, in resin that conveys, it gives it like a very spectral um, quality, which is something that I continue exploring later in the later years. Um, and then you can see the same um, process that I was doing with the other works that I'm using um, the, the patterns to create this kind of constructivist sculptures making specific references to like, like the Tatlin monument and, and also to um, um, the way now, now Mungabo conceived uh, volume as an intersection of different planes. Then um, around the same time then, um, I brought from Mexico a bullfighter's cape that I took apart uh, with my seamstress and um, we created the pattern of it. This is not working. Oh, this is the pattern. And we made one in canvas, the same um, height and it's called the raised mirror. And I used that title because the, the cape in the bullfight um, works as a mirror whereby the the only way the matador can kill the, the animal is by diverting his gaze from, from the gaze of the bullfighter. And uh, that happens in the myth of Perseus and um, the Medusa in the way the only way that um, Perseus could kill the Medusa was by using the shields so that the Medusa could see herself 
the only thing that she could, and then he managed to, um, to kill the Medusa. That's why it's called the race mirror. So already this pattern became very, very important in the works that I developed subsequently. Um, and already you can see that by the virtue of it being very minimal and very abstract, subsequently the works developed um, somehow in that spirit. So the first two um, works that I made really sculptural in the kind of more, I'm making reference to the modern tradition where these two whereby I bent the plywood, I bent a piece of plywood in the shape of the pattern of the cape and produce these two pieces. And with the same pattern, I produced a series of shapes that um, I used to produce a series of drawings where I was tracing and over tracing and over tracing many times with a very fine pencil, the shapes in different juxtapositions. And then I was thinking, well, how can I um, translate this work into a sculptural um, context? And I made that sketch over there, which is the idea of using the same shapes but inscribed in some panels. And I'll show you what was the result. Here are all the shapes juxtaposed. And in the drawings I had, the two elements of the drawings uh, were just paper and pencil and thinking about how to translate those two elements into a sculptural context, I decided to use large pieces of Baltic plywood where the actual surface of the plywood would be the paper. And then the, the, the side of the different layers of, um, the plywood would become the drawing. And I'll show you um, how, how that worked. You can see here, this work has uh, four panels, the large panels, and you can see the striations in the panels here. So, Coming back to these works, um, the next step that I asked myself was how, how, can I, how can I make something out of these shapes and how can I create and make a volume or sculpture or an, out, of the, out of the negative spaces of these um, uh, works. And I made a number of small, no, I'm going all the way back. I made a number of small pieces in plaster um, that derived from, from, from the negative of, of those shapes. And I created these sculptures in large scale in fiberglass racing and polyurethane. Now these works still, as you can see, these works are still tied up to the bullfighting kind of body of work that I was doing previously. But if you weren't for the title, you wouldn't know they have any relationship to that tradition or to that body of work. And they're obviously very informed by my love of modern sculpture and cycladic sculpture, which um, you will see throughout the rest of the presentation. And there's a, in these works, there's a lot of um, um, an aspect of, of, of um, gravity that I play with them and kinetic also. It's about like, it's almost like it's about to rest on the floor. It's, you know, in, in a way that the cape also kind of, you know, rests gently on the surfaces. These two are titled Chiquelina. No, this is Chiquelina. And again, these are works that are about this big and they rock gently. And you can see the, the but I was telling you about my, the particular relationship to cycladic sculpture, which is that kind of oblong surface where in cycladic sculpture, the, the plane starts to become form. This one is titled Veronica. 
And again, these titles are taken from different uh, types of passes of the Cape. Now here you can see how you know, the, these works are born out of the negative spaces of the panels here. This is an exhibition in um, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. So the way I worked or, you know, and I still work like that, is like I work through mutations and permutations and there's a lot of, um, of um, scrap pieces that, that are produced along the process. And I had so many small scrap pieces from models that I was making and I decided to juxtapose and play with them. And I did a whole series uh, called Tablones. And um, they're very, very uh, vertical and they make reference to a series of works by the Venezuelan modern artist, um, Alejandro Tero. Alejandro Tero, that he made this Tablones. So I made about 20 of this. And here I began to get very, very interested in the relationship between light and shadow, highlights and shadows and how highlights and shadows can actually make the work immaterial and also with the whiteness of, of the surfaces. And again, this is an example where nothing went to waste. All the parts from these uh, pieces were cut and repositioned in different ways. And also you can see, for example, how the shadow becomes integral part of the work and it becomes material at the same time while the rest of the work is trying to, to, to be immaterial against the surface of the wall. And these are the last two pieces that I did in that series where the, the, the layers became much thinner because the intention was to actually be able to hang the works and give the illusion that they are drawn, they're the drawings, just with highlights and, and shadows. So you, you can see in the work that is being exhibited here to that, that the way the light is working against the work is very fundamental. I also found ways of stretching these shapes and and continue the same uh, process of trying to find um, volumes that will be born out of the shapes. And this is a small um, example of, um, of what I was making at the time. The work is called, um, actually it's not erotis, it's erotijo. And I'll show you why it's called like that. So these are two of the erotes. Erotes um, is a word that comes from Greek mythology and the erotes were semi-gods uh, of love and desire, um, especially of um, homosexual desire. Uh, they were winged gods. And at the time I was um, making a lot of drawings and picture, taking pictures of sails and boats in Maine. And that was part of the inspiration of making these works on these shapes because they, they resemble sails, but at the same time, the wings. Um, and there, there's another one that's missing here, but the, you know, they're obviously very phallic works. And um, this is another example of erotes where I was using the the parts of the shapes that were trashed in my studio in small um, pieces and then um, brought them to a larger dimension. Again, tr transparency is also an important part of these works um, as the line travels around the, the planes and comes in and comes out. And again, the highlights and the shadows on the, on the different uh, layers um, make the work, activate the work. Uh, this is the example of the erotillo. Um, I made a number of works of casts that uh, came out of the mold, not the way I wanted it because it couldn't stay the way I wanted, I wanted them, whether it was upright or 
laying down. So I decided to give them a little a, a crutch here to you know stand them up, put them on the column. The idea is that um, it's, it's like a like a resting. You know, in, in in classical antiquity, there's this tradition of the reclining sculpture that is resting on a pedestal or on or on something. And the idea here is that uh, this uh, this rotation is resting on the on, on the cylinder that is coming out of this other cylinder. And there's a strong relationship between my sculpture and my kind of uh, mural work in ways that are quite evident here. You can see the shape here, and you can see the the kind of resting. Uh, Plane there. These are, are close ups. This is called lingam, and that's an enretillo. And lingam, of course, is also part of the um, kind of phallic tradition in, in Hinduism. And this is um, a I was also commissioned to make a large mural um, in New York, and this is one of the works that came out of that project. These are panels, again, large panels. And again, I'm following the same strategy of um, wanting to, to bring the work alive through light. And this, the gesso that I use on these works is very vibrant, it's very luminous. This one is titled loop, and you can see the loop is here. It's a closed loop. And the other one is um, double loop. This is a model that I did for that commission, and it, 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 in, it in, involved several panels and several doors that I had to design, and that would intersect some of the um, for example, this is the entrance door to, to the apartment, and this is the, the door to the coat room that when you open it, um, interacts with other figure creating another image. And the same goes here. These measures are uh, 10 feet by 23 feet, and I use my same materials, MDF, and line plaster. So in the dining room, there's a, this door here is actually in a pocket wall that when it, it's, it's, it's meant to close the dining room to the rest of the corridor, which is here. So it creates a different environment when, when you open it or close it. And the, the, all the panels interlock, like, um, so I don't have better pictures uh, for this uh, mural piece, but this is the best I have. Gives you an idea. This is uh, the, the door that comes out of that wall that intersects the, uh, the perpendicular intersects this panel and creates a different environment. This is the corridor. This is on the other side of the corridor and this is the other door that I was telling you about. So for another commission, um, I was asked to produce um, three sketches for a a kitchen that had three walls that architect wanted me to dress up. So I produced this um, museum board studies of it. And again, one thing that you can see here already is that I'm already wanting to break the, the frame of the work and have the work be as part of the wall inside the wall and behind the wall. You can see that in this piece here, which is taken from one of those models. And the other thing that the architect wanted me to do was to, there was this obtrusive column inside um, the apartment and he wanted me to dress it up, to give it some anim animated. And I produced this work. I mean, this is actually not the work because the, the commission never got carried out. Um, and then I thought, well, what a great opportunity to, to make a, a karyotid. And this is a rendering of the project. I'm starting to do more architectural uh, projects um, in the last um, few years. This is a rendering. The, the orientation of the column here is not correct, but anyway, this is, um, this was gonna be a shelf here. So this is the entrance to the kitchen. That's the corridor and the other, picture that you saw 
was uh, the entrance to the um, apartment building. And this is another um, horizontal version of that other work that I, um, I created another mural for another client. These are terrible pictures again, because this is my iPhone. I don't have better pictures, but the work gives you an idea. And again, was, the idea was to embed the work on the wall following the same principle or using the wall as a membrane, as a membrane that actually breathes. And then we come to what we have here, the Harm Museum. And the idea was of my presentation was to show you how I go from, you know, a tradition such as bullfighting that is the least abstract and is the least minimalist to, you know, what I've been doing during the last few years. Thank you. You hear me? Yeah. Yes. Well, what a privilege to be able to be speaking to these great artists. You know, I think that anybody who says that there is not that, you know, um, art is sometimes not apparently you know, a matter of a lot of research. It's clearly that, you know, this artists have been showing that it's clearly a lot of research gets into each of these pieces and the type of work they have been doing has been uh, remarkable in that regard. Um, there is a microphone in the back to ask questions. Um, I would like to try to engage in a conversation between all of us. I have some questions, of course, you know, but uh, if I would like to hear you first, you know, and then, then we can enter into a dialogue between us. Um, uh, Sergio, please. Hello? Let me say your name and then. Yeah, yeah. yeah Sergio Vega. <laughs> Hello, friends. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to uh, congratulate Jesus on uh, this organizing the event on one hand, but the selection mm -hmm. of these three artists. <laughs> because to me, as I uh, was, I wasn't familiar with, uh, with the work of two of you, or at least closely, right? But one of the things that uh, kind of emerged from this talk to me was the notion that the, the three of you seem to be really interested in uh, a kind of liminal space mm -hmm. uh, that could be in maybe in conventional philosophical perspective could be related as the, uh, the space between immanence and transcendence. Mm -hmm. And uh, that on one hand, the, the, the creation of that communication between the, 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 the emission and the reception huh? and the message in between, the space of uh, seduction that the cape or the bullfighter embodies, that is the liminal space between the horn of the, of the bull and the sword of the bullfighter and that negotiation of desire. And in your case, uh, the, 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 the liminal space of, of entering the forbidden landscape, the impossible landscape that may be the encounter of death, right? And, and that space, um, I, 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 I'm very interested in how is that you construct that, that uh, possibility of, of transcending that, transcending that uh, that cognitive space hmm, uh, through the body and through the experience of your work. But then another thing that came to mind uh, and is the fact that we are dealing with a collection of Latin American art and you are from Latin America. And we probably, we have all uh, come from the absurd experience of having to justify what we do in relation to Latin America, uh, which is, as we know, a colonial construct that we are still kind of like uh, cursed by, but also a reality that we are part of. How, how is that this, uh, the, this, this exploration of that liminal space, or if there is any relationship to you 
being from Latin America and for you the, the need or the desire to construct the liminal space? Thank you. That's an interesting question. So, I mean, I don't know if Amalia wants to reply first, you know, and then and then we go um, maybe in the same order that uh, we made the presentations. Amalia, take, uh, unmute yourself. I am unmuted. I am unmuted. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. I I. It's always so complicated, uh, the question of uh, being a Latin American artist. I think that um, one of the things that uh, I can say is that I sort of, um, it's, yeah, I, I didn't realize that I was a Latin American artist until I um, left Argentina. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, like uh, when the, the work that is in the, exhibition uh, was part of the C4 awards pro program. And I met a lot of Latin American artists in Miami. <laughs> so I, I think it's, um, it's a complicated one. And I think um, I, I think that at different points, I've sort of have to come up with different strategies on how to deal with it and the discomfort that it brings. Um, and uh, one of them is like I often thought that it's sort of I like to be like a bar, bar of soap like um, to, to sort of never answer straight about it and never allow myself to be pinpoint uh, or pigeonholed uh, but it's also one of those things that it is like someone uh, calling you fat you know nobody's allowed to call me Latin American but I'm allowed to call myself Latin American um, so it's so it's something that I feel sort of both complicated. There is a sort of a, a cultural intimacy that uh, that I do feel that is undeniable, but it's also a subject that is sort of uncomfortable to speak about. Is that is that in itself a liminal space? I guess you know, <laughs> being a bar of soap, you know. Um, yeah, I guess it's like. Um, I don't know. I obviously I can't speak to it in philosophical terms. I stopped a long time ago trying to um, um, to trying to speak in terms uh, that I don't speak um, as an artist. I think we we have ways of talking about things that are not necessarily um, versed in philosophy. So I wouldn't want to um, venture into an area of knowledge that I will always be um, a guest at. Uh, but I can say is that. Um, it does sort of, um, it crosses our practices, um, it does. Wonderful. Alice? Um, yes, I, I totally agree with Amalia. It's not a very straightforward uh, answer. Um, I, I will try to answer it very personally, which is not something that in general I, I bring um, to the discussion of the work. I wouldn't say, I mean, consciously, I would not be coming from or striving to be coming from um, making work from the point of view of someone, of, of a Brazilian artist. Um, I, I don't do that. On the other hand, um, the way you grow up and your, your first experiences of nature, whatever, the concept, the construction of the concept might be, um, it's always, and, and the whole history of, of a person's life, it's completely informed by your experience of place and, and geography. And as you, I mean, as all, not only geography, but the geopolitics behind um, the place where you're from. I mean, what kind of place that holds in in the in the globe and in the case of being brazilian or latin america but i mean i i, I would be only able to speak by myself uh, for myself but it is a it is a peripheral space right so growing up a woman uh that i'm gonna get really personal but i mean growing up a woman and a, a gay woman in brazil um in this sort of, um, so belonging to some sort of marginalized group in this already marginalized country, which is, we Brazilians don't like to, to perceive Brazil as a periphery, but that's what it is. 
yes, um, can give you this slight um, shifted perception of things and, and no hangover uh, against the fact that we are not the center of the world, right? So you are always a little bit dislocated. It can also be a, an, an interesting point of view, but I guess that really informs my interest in uh, looking at marginalized spaces and their histories. Wonderful, thank you. Jose Gabriel. Yeah, well, in my case, um... I became a Latin American artist um, in the United States, and I became for the first time Hispanic here. And um, so it was, there were contradictions and issues that I tried to understand as, as much as repel, because the way I consider myself, um, I'm multinational and, and multilingual, uh, multicultural, and I never had a label until I came um, uh, to the United States. But apart from that, um, my journey through uh, the world of the, of, the, of the corrida wasn't a conscious decision about being that part of my heritage, if you like. It was more about an exploration of my sexuality. So. When I was doing um, that body of work, it caught the attention of um, the New York Art Gallery world because, you know, I was being somehow a token of that kind of um, Hispanicity, cultural heritage that, you know, I mean, I don't have, I didn't have a problem with that, but, um, you know, I just wanted to make a point that uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't about a, a, a searching for my roots or my, my cultural traditions in Venezuela. It was just about my sexuality and more about my homosexuality. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I do have a question uh, for, one, for each of you. Um, I, wa I want to um, maybe uh, discuss um, with Amalia, I mean, the, the work for me is so incredibly insistent and such a uh, consistent work on looking at the process of communication. You know, there is almost a sort of a display of the way in which communication happens. You know, ears, big ears, you know, I mean, you have um, um, lecterns, you know, I mean, other works that we have not shown, you know, you have a megaphone, there is always someone saying something and someone receiving a message, you know, or, and so I, and, and what, what your work basically does is basically, you know, shows us that, that, that level. I mean, uh, the latitas, you know, the little cans, you know, going one place to the other, you know, trying to hear and saying something. And what you do is basically you somehow, you know, coalesce that, into into the sculptural work, you know, and, and I find that you know fascinating, you know, and 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 incredibly interesting. But I will have to say that you know, for our other two artists here, you know, something something similar to that happens. For me, the temporal is so important in both of your works. You know, I mean, in the case of Alice, you know, it was there was a ton of trepidation when you passed those images. You know, I mean, I was like, oh my goodness. I know, I know that you are here, you know, but, you know, I was like, ooh, and the way that you display them with that particular separation, you were very insistent on the separation of the images because that's basically time also there, you know, presented in some, in a, in a physical way. And I will not have, I mean, exactly the same thing happens here. You know, I think that's um, in the case of, in, the, in your work, you know, you have all these movements, La Veronica, La Media Veronica, the this, the that, you know, which are basically movements in time, you know, that the Kate moves, and all the time you try to coalesce them, and all the time, you know, what you find is a sculpture. I don't know if, I mean, I think that uh, what Sergio's question had to do with basically the liminal space in terms of mediums, you know, a medium that was not trying to get what, you know, they were showing some sort of failure of, of a medium. In the case of photography, you cannot see the minds. What kind of, what kind, I mean, 
is this a photograph of the mind? So it's a photograph of something else. You know, in, in your case, it's, that's, you cannot do the same thing with the Veronica. The Veronica is just like, or the, the cape movement, you know I mean? That has, a, has a, such an effect, but all the sudden, boom, you have it there. Um, and obviously with, with Malia Sim. So I, I would like to hear a little bit about, you know, shifting from, uh, from, from, from Latin America to, to temporal aspects of it. You know, um, if, you can, if you can elaborate maybe a little bit on this, you know, how know if, if I sound, sound um, if I'm in, on the right track or not, you know, Amalia. So the question is about the notion of tempor temporality in the work or? Yeah, yeah in the sculpture yeah. work and the very physical sculptural work, you know, yeah. that you have there. So I think um, I, I've studied uh, in, in a terrible art school, basically, but it was a very academic art school. <laughs> uh, and I studied sculpture. Um, it, was a, it was a very sort of traditional thing, you know, we, we carved stone and modeled busts of people and standing figures and, um, and, um, and it was like about lifting heavy. There weren't a lot of women in the department, in fact, and it was like always a joke. Um, but I think as a result, I, my practice became really, really immaterial for at, at sort of the beginning of my artistic life. And at some point I sort of returned to the object. I think that objects um, um, have this thing of um, needing us, uh, but also existing without us. Um, so I often in my work, there's a notion of activation of an object so that you have a sculpture that functions as a sculpture. So if you arrive there and there's no one using, activating the sculpture, if no one is throwing the book against the wall, if no one is using the cans, if no one is saying anything into sort of a concrete podium, um, it doesn't matter, you haven't missed anything. Uh, but there's always the possibility of um, the using of the sculpture um, for something else, let's say. Wonderful. So that they have this sort of interdependency Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the notion of time is something that at least that, that in something so sort of ever so permanent as a sculpture, mm -hmm. um, there's also this sense of, uh, of being able to turn time on and off uh, by sort of defining it by the context of who is using it and what is being said. Wonderful. Thank you. Incredible work. Thank you. Elise? Um, so the, the question of time Yes, that, that's the consideration. I mean, that's true. In, in, in the way that you display the works, I mean, because it's very different from seeing displayed, you know, and spatially, you know, and instead of seeing it like one after the other, you know. So for me, the how, how time is there manifested spatially, you know, for me, that was something that has resonated a lot. And I think mm -hmm. there is something to be said in relation to the fact that the medium cannot carry you know, you cannot see, you know, as, as a photographer, you, how can you see the minds? Mm. The moment that you see the minds, you're gone, quote unquote, or, or, or the moment that you don't see the minds, you're gone. You know? Yeah, or you the know? moment you feel them. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's a little bit too late. Yes. Yeah, it's a little bit too late. So, yeah. so just that. Um, I think it would be interesting if, tell me if, the, if this begins to be a very long answer. Yeah, but I would like to relate that to my, uh, my previous work, which was about Chernobyl, the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And then that work dealt uh, with uh, a kind of impenetrability, which is really physically invisible, which is the, the gamma radiation itself that to this day um, is still not only haunts, but actually embodies physically the whole substance, the whole substance of this whole area, which is a Chernobyl exclusion zone. And then the problem of that work was it, how is it that we look at it by what means in, in this kind of um, reality, which is in that space is um, completely pervasive, but never really perceived by our senses in any way. Um, so that, that work dealt with a problem of, um, a visual impenetrability, the, the exploration being what kind of images might, I mean, might it, be, might it be possible to touch this invisibility and by which way. Once I finished Chernobyl, um, 
I was still intrigued by this idea of impenetrable spaces, um, but different kinds of um, landscapes and different kinds of, of contamination issues, they ask different questions. So the next, for me, the next obvious uh, step was then try to look at this other kind of impenetrable uh, space, I mean, problem where what is inaccessible, it's not, it's not the visual itself, but the actual space that you want that I would like to cross. In that case, the space of minefields. So, of course, you, of course, you cannot see the mines, but mines are not physically invisible, truly like radiation is. It's something else. That what it's what you cannot um, penetrate is the actual space. But for me as a photographer coming from the background of film and photography, that was really um, that was really exciting because that space we can actually see. And the depth of field uh, is a construction of photographs, right? There's a depth of the actual land that you see and that like Kappa showed, uh, oftentimes you cannot reach, right? If you stay, if you stay in the middle of it, um, Yes. Okay. I think I'm losing myself a little bit. That's fine. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a wonderful meandering into it. Yeah. Um, so my... I want to something. Can I say something? Please. Please. It's just that it's also to sort of um, when you um, talked about your novel and you think of what's happening in Ukraine today. Um, that I think one of the, the the big things that is sort of left out of the frame as well is the the, the aspect of human tragedy and mm -hmm. how empathy. I think we've all seen the images today and felt um, the pain of the Ukrainian people uh, in a way that we will never be able to feel it. To feel it, but you know, it's like you would have said Chernobyl. Um, a month ago, and and maybe that would have resonated in a very different way. So, empathy also sort of cuts across time in a sense, and sort of um, takes over what I don't know. It just felt like I couldn't Wonderful. let you move on from Chernobyl without. <laughs> yeah, no, but about that, I guess one thing that we, it's very it becomes then very material, and we don't realize that it seems that we talk about Chernobyl as a as it it seems to be this event in the past. But the, the victims and the consequences of Chernobyl, they are actual. They happen in the present tense. Like in, we, see them, we, we see them until today and we'll continue to see forever because in, in terms of the, the actual time frame of radiation contamination, it's not in a human scale. It's really global in time. So it will be at least 800 years until the radiation goes down to, to a level where humans could come back there. And the consequences for for life, all kind of life, human life and 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 natural and and animals, um, they they are constant. So it, it's this kind of events, and in that way, a little bit similar to to minefields that that remain decades after conflict ends. Uh, they remain in the present tense. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um. My trajectory through art school is the opposite of Amalia's. I went to very, very non-traditional um, art schools and uh, during the first decade of my art career and through my schooling, I, I did mostly time-based work and very, very ephemeral. And um, so over the years, as I was moving forward, um, I found that I had a need, well, I went through a whole period of creating installations that in some way um, reflected a process of time in the intrinsic narrations that were taking place in those installations. And then I started moving, moving into the bullfighting. Well, the bullfighting uh, period was part of that installation. And then uh, moving into the, the more kind of traditional, if you like, types cultural that I produced, and it was a particular need to um, to to learn to do something. You know, when I did those first two casts, I mean, I had never done a cast. I had never done a sculpture. 
or a, or, or a painting or anything of that nature. And, um, and as I move forward and forward, what I realize is that in that arch of time from the years of my formation as an artist to today, those issues of um, impermanence and um, ephemerality that, and spectrality that were in my, my very early work is what I have been trying to, to attain through a whole different um, practice, type of practice. Yeah, excellent. I, we have time for a couple of more questions. I have more questions but for, for them, but you know, I would love, I would love to hear you guys, you know. Um, so there is a microphone, you, one person there? Yeah. Hi, yeah. If you can this say your is, name. Oh, Jane. <laughs> Um, I had a question with the minefields one and, and Chernobyl, of course, was spread evenly. And I, I'm scared to think of why Putin is specifically going after that. But, but the mines, I guess the, um, the not ropes, but um, the way that it was designated a path was a, presumably a safe path. But I didn't know if the mines were set out in a in any kind of pattern if they found that, because I thought the way that you displayed yours not only presented the time of stepping through as you moved forward, but maybe also that how things are positioned versus um, there's a whole problem with unplanned unexploded ordnance, um, UXOs that were dropped from planes and things that never exploded and then are just scattered on the ocean floor, like in Viejo and, other places that that things were tested, but and now people sometimes just find them, and I don't know if that would be something that you would display differently if you were to do something along those lines because of the more randomness of the uh, items. Um, no, so the way there are there are different uh, process of. Um, going going about this all of the minefields i went to are in the process in, in the early process of the mining so i went uh, in a collaboration either with the mining bodies from governments as in cambodia or ngos as the halo trust for instance in um in colombia all of all of the minefields that we see here uh, they were uh, in they are in the early process of mapping, which meaning um, it's a it's a long uh, protocol of locating uh, to the to the in the, I mean the best ability possible. It's never one hundred percent safe, but it's as safe as it can be in terms of where the the explosives are. That's that's level one, and then once that's all mapped. Uh, there is this whole discussion then what what to do with with all these bombs and, and there are different and it's not only my it's not only landmines you're right it's different things for instance cluster munition which is something that the states have used extensively in Afghanistan which is the, the bombs which are from plane from the air to the ground and they they explode in the air into many different sub munitions which stay on the land. And it's particularly cruel because they, uh, this, this little submunitions, they have very bright colors and they are meant for kids to go see what, what, what they are and then, and then get exploded. So they are actually meant to, to create this, not only this impenetrable space, but this sort of a atmosphere of fear and this everlasting occupation of land, for instance, in Cambodia is a problem to their economy because they have so much land that is so fertile, but it's just full, full, full of these things. Um, so all of, all of the minefields that we see here, I mean, I would not walk across a minefield with no mapping because that, that would be suicidal, yes. But, um, they were all, um, in different stages of early mapping, the, the one that was really early, early, early stage and we had no map was Colombia. 
uh, where the only thing that we uh, could use at that point were those, those kinds of different little markings that we saw in the jungle with, with uh, little colors, meaning if it, it might be an explosive, it's a confirmed explosive, um, what's the percentage uh, that that thing has of coming off or not. And then once, if you, if you at least have that, that, uh, that sort of marks in the landscape, then that's when you negotiate what kind of uh, path might be possible. That's why in Colombia, it was so tricky and it was only possible to, to do those seven steps that we see here. Anyone else? Yes. I have the mic. Um, so first of all, thank you guys for speaking. Enjoyed all of your, um, what you guys had to say. And I wanted to ask, speaking through the lens of the Matador series, I thought it was interesting how you said that you work through, uh, I believe you said permutations and tr transformations. And I wanted to ask, like, as your practice continued, um, how much of it is still focused on the matador and how much has changed towards this um, desire to project like light and design and like this flat 2D image. And then for all of you guys, um, how has your practice and your focus changed as you've progressed throughout your works? And that's my question. I don't know if um, Jose Gabriel, you want yeah, to speak first? Um, and we'll go in reverse. Yeah, mutations way. and permutations. And um, I think that I briefly mentioned during my presentation that as I was moving away from the narratives that were intrinsic to the work that I was doing as part of installations, um, and the works became more decanted, uh, more formal, if you like. And they gradually became autonomous and, and separating from, from the source, from the matrix of, 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 um, of the cape and all, and all of that. Um, however, everything that I've done, pretty much everything that I've done uh, from that time on, has its origin in that particular um, matrix. Um, it's like a, it's been generating by, as I said, mutations and permutations. Um, but I'm not interested anymore in, in making uh, a visible or recognizable uh, reference. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Alice? Um, how my, how the interest uh, evolves in, in our work, right? That's the question. Um, from, from all of these, my, my recent projects and, and, and until to this day, I guess the outer frame of my research I mean, deals with a problem of landscape, of landscape representation, which is of course a team, in, I mean, a subject matter in the history of art. Um, and that in itself, is interesting to begin with because I mean, what is this thing called landscape? Um, what aesthetic uh, cognitive operation is behind that? That when we look at fragments of nature and, and then decided to call it landscape and it's of course um, um, a, a solely human experience, right? Um, our fellow animals, they are, they are one with nature and actually so are we. So when we see this natural landscape, it's because we, we um, there is this, for us humans, there is, I mean, we are, we are in the process of, of having to rethink that in, term, in terms of the environment, but this, this fracture as if we were not it and, and all one. Right, because we look at a landscape, a natural landscape, it's something there. The same goes to the concept of nature. Like, what do we mean by when we say nature? So that is the our, our frame um, of my interest, of, of my research. But then um, on, on the top of that, um, I'm, the, my interest keeps evolving into try to look at this um, 
places that might seem unaltered, but actually have been um, changed substantially by the misaction of men, by our misactions, such as Chernobyl, such as all of the, the minefields that we see here, or, or a current interest of mine, for instance, it's also the fires in the Amazon, um, which, I mean, which we all know are happening now, but actually have been happening for decades. It's only more, even more of a tragedy in, in this current climate, in this current government, uh, in, in, which is a very deranged government that we have in Brazil at the moment. Um, so, it, from Chernobyl to the minefield, the evolution was that one, uh, one had this problem to look at something which is physically invisible in terms of the substance matter of, of that energy itself, which is the invisible radioactive contamination. In the case of Chernobyl, it's gamma radiation. And then shifting from that to another, to a different kind of impenetrable space, which in the case of the minefields, is really in the land. Wonderful. Amalia? Unmute yourself. Um, so for me, my my work has always been very different from itself. Uh, and I think that for a while that generated a lot of anxiety. And then I just decided to go with it. And so um, I've sort of, you know, I've been lucky and I've been making work for a long time. There's a lot of artwork. And so um, there's a sort of a, a, a way of thinking about sort of change that it, that doesn't have to do with progression or to think sort of a work like it's just a constellation of thoughts and then ideas and I sort of make things five years later that relate with questions that I started 10 years uh, before and that sort of project into the future how many, you know, there are uh, loose ends that I leave all the time that I go back to. And so what you saw today, it's almost like an exercise on myth making. I sort of open and I go, oh, I'm showing this work in that exhibition. Let me just pull these works. Um, and it's never sort of a progressive. So I don't think uh, at sort of uh, the development of my work in terms of a linear process. Um, but I sort of accept that there is an area of interest that I have. and. And there isn't sort of a way that in which things look, but eventually there's a sort of an air of family between the works. So I'm sort of, um, I've relaxed about sort of allowing change in the work um, um, so that I'm sort of um, not so bothered with consistency anymore for many, many years. Um, but I think that has to do with sort of the accumulation of um, so many ways of thinking and, and actually objects and the things that we make, there are things that we talk around rather than we can't talk them. We talk around them. And so um, talking about them and presenting them in a coherent uh, sort of way as a string of ideas is, is it might be very different tomorrow, uh, but the work never feels like that. Wonderful. Um, I think it's eight o'clock already, um, but I will take one more question in case someone wants to say something or Jose, you want to say something? You want the microphone? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, like Jose Gabriel, mm -hmm. Amalia, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Alice, that are so challenging to look at, the, at their work mm -hmm. on, on the, under the, the lens of, uh, of uh, Latin American art. So what, what, what it means for you to be here <laughs> sharing with us this, uh, um, this evening? A couple of, couple of things. Uh, what I will say is that, first of all, I am. Um, I want to point out the two things. First, there is a slight discomfort 
or not saying, I'm just simply saying it's light because I think it was a discomfort always of, of talking about the topic, of putting the topic on top. You know, I think that Sergio was the one who, who mentioned it. And it was probably for him, it's also a discomfort, you know? And um, one of my latest essays on this issue had to do with exactly that, I start with that, with always the discomfort of an artist, you know, thinking, I mean, saying like, let's talk about Latin America. Not really, I don't really want to address it. You know, it feels kind of weird. It's there, but it's not there, you know, I, and, and, you know, once needs to, one, we need to pay attention to that. I mean, there is something being said there, clearly, why there is a discomfort. And I think that the discomfort has to do with the fact that, you know, it has becoming, I mean, it, it, it became, I mean, in this way uh, in which globalization, are, you know, was, I mean, um, expanded itself to some degree. We, I mean, Latin America functioned as a, as a pigeon holding label. You know, and a way in which you know you need to do just one thing, you know, you, and, do, and you only need to be addressing about your own problems, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, which was, I mean, uh, a complete uh, problem to some degree. For for I mean, think about Alice. Alice is doing a work about the world. I mean, about landscape. You know, you know, um, Amal is doing about communication. You know, I mean, and nothing to do with Latin America per se. You know, quote unquote. You know, but you know, there were some impositions. You know, and I think Jose Gabriel has already mentioned, you know, there was a way in which you could use it, you could utilize it effectively, because, you know, we all have a label in some ways, you know, at some point, you know, if the, if the gallery in New York wants you to get there because you are like doing this, well, why not, you know, I mean, we all have to live of something, you know, but it became at some point a very, very hard straitjacket almost. You know, and I think that is a discomfort that is being felt, you know, to some degree. You, we need to do certain things and we need to speak about certain issues and we need to have two or three traditions. And that has become stale, not only stale, it has become fossilized and has become a problem for, for the artists. And yes, they do acknowledge they come from a tradition. They do acknowledge they come from a, from, from a place. We all come from somewhere, you know, and we all have moved somewhere else. I mean, all of us are... I don't know, with the section of Pereira of Alice who lives in Brazil in, in where he, she was born, we all are like from different parts, you know? Um, so there is that, there is that to be said, you know? And I feel that, you know, that, so it is, we need to have clearly, you know, new ways of understanding what is a cultural production of the region. You know, we need to understand that. Maybe there are other matrices we have not observed, you know, maybe, I mean, that we have not um, been, not just simply, um, not just simply um, uh, related to basically, you know, all atavic um, essentialisms to some degree, you know, or to certain types of, uh, certain types of, of, of the way in which, you know, we are um, placed you know, um, in the market, you know, I mean, I mean, Amalia just said, you know, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 that, you know, oh, you might be, I mean, she goes to Holland, you know, oh, you must be, you know, you must be like, you know, so, so suffering so much because of the cold when, you know, <laughs> when she's from the you know, and down in Patagonia, I mean, that is, that is quite remarkable. I mean, that, that already tells you the whole thing, you know, I don't think it's a problem of Latin Americans. I don't think, I think it's a lot of the problem about like the way in which, you know, the global system has basically pigeonholed us, you know, in certain aspects of it, you know. Um, and I think we are fighting against that, you know, to some degree in order to be able to really get out of, out of that positioning, you know, um, that positioning that only caters to a ghetto, basically, you know, and it doesn't open up into a larger conversation without the, the asterisk without the little thing that says, well, we are Latin American artists, you know, and that's basically the, a larger horizon and a larger landscape that we should be able to inhabit without, you know, having a problem, you know, so that's what I think. Um, any question, any extra question? Sergio wants to say something, last urgent words. Well, you know, we, we've been in this, uh, in this boat for a while of being Latin Americans, right? I remember when I got the invitation to the opening at the Museum of Modern Art uh, of Latin American Art, uh, Latin American Artists of the 20th Century, was it? Or something like that. Uh, in the invitation, it said, please dress colorful. 
you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at, at that time, I was working with 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 Dante, with the idea of Dante Alighieri, and so Dante became a parrot then, you know, and for many many reasons. Uh, so I, I chose to to engage with that expectation, uh, which is this literal uh, expectation of or having some reference to where you come from, being part of that, which is unfortunately today in the world of identity politics, you know, and political correctness, there is this whole expectation that through your artistic world, there should be something that could be traced back to where you come from and you're commenting on that through your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think probably that expectation had existed uh, before in, in the history of art. But today it feels so much like a straitjacket because in Latin America, we have dealt with a lot of the notion of segregation. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I came to this country, there were no galleries showing Latin American art. Mm -hmm. Basically there were two in New York and I was working with one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I the mean, other one was showing pre-Columbian stuff, probably. You know, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, and and people will, I will meet um, people that will tell me, "Oh, you are from Latin America, and you have and you have artists in there." Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's the world, you know. And and I think that that expectation is still around there. I, I mean, think, it's not gone. Huh? I think I think that you know, just to cap this, you know, just with the last thing I will say, maybe 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 a little bit. Uh, complicated, but uh, the truth is that you know you were. It has been enhanced by the way you know that, you know, in the discussion. I mean, in the dialogue that has happened with the United States, especially you know, the way in which the United States understands multiculturalism, the way in the way in the way that the United States understands you know cultural distinctions. Um, that is a model that doesn't fit us. You know, that's a model that doesn't fit us. So that's why we feel. I mean. Pigeonhole, you know. Exactly. That's what we feel. That's what that's that is the, the the real problem is there. There are two different syntaxes. There are two different ways of understanding um, the two ways of different ways of understanding what what you know what you should do with your identity in, in cultural terms. You know. So that is basically. I mean, we are, for lack of better word, you know. I mean, in Latin America, we want to be universal, quote unquote. You know, you come here and then you are basically press in terms of heritage, because you are from one community, you know, mm -hmm. and then you are saying like, put in a ghetto, you know, according to- But that's know, also extreme. It's, it's extremely complicated in terms of becoming like a representative, which- Exactly, exactly, exactly. exactly. You, are expect, ex you are expected to represent it. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, that is, but it makes you somehow, it makes you feel like a traitor to yeah, actually yeah. where you come from. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it's, that is, a, but it's, is there are two different models, you know, that are like a dispute here, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and that's why all the people who have been in this international scene feel that, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they feel that in a way in which is, you know, what to do. I mean, all the sudden I'm a, I say, I mean, I have this text called No Me Token, you know, don't tokenize me, you know, but in Spanish called No Me Token, precisely because of that, don't, 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 don't tokenize me in, in a certain ways, you know, um, that is done, you know, because of that need in order to become a representative, a, a token of one particular tradition, one particular tradition that is homogeneous and you know and and, and stable and what whatever you know. Now that is a that is a way of uh, um, those are two models of dispute. Uh, we might be need to um, a way of a way of uh, coming out of that. You know, might be not to look that much at uh, at, at the United States. <laughs> yeah, probably. You know, well, maybe, now, maybe. but now the expectation <laughs> is not. Before it was that we should be from the jungle or or of indigenous descent or whatever represent something like that, and now it's more about now that we are supposed to be Latinx, right? We are supposed to represent our poor neighborhood that we came from a poor neighborhood in the United States. And so forth, we need to reflect on that mm -hmm. as if the immigrant experience was all the same for everyone and all the countries of Latin America, which are so diverse, were all one. And is this a priori construction which constructs mm -hmm. identities as a kind of uh, uh, species? And you are supposed to be a specimen that represents that species. Yeah. And, and if you are a mismatch, because you are a complex person, 
then it's a mismatch. Then why is that? Mm -hmm. It's it's a very complicated problem. Well, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, with, with that note, um, I really want to thank everyone here and in uh, the virtual sphere, I guess, you know, and it's inclu starting with Amalia, who is like in London. And thank you, Amalia, for staying. How late is there? Probably midnight, you know, so um, you are muted. Uh -oh. One of, uh, one it's, of one it's one of right. so wow. thank you so much for staying with us and thank you everyone else for for i mean everyone here for 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 the conversation thank you jesus so much not only for the incredible show that you have done for bringing us here but for thinking very creatively and almost in a sort of like you know i don't know like a like a master like you know uh acupuncturist you know, for finding these artists, you know, <laughs> uh, together that actually work together very well. Muchas gracias. Thank you.